I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. We're talking about Corona Watch. We're talking about the coronavirus. We're talking about economics. We're talking about local economics and also global economics with a global economics professor at Chaminade. Political economics, he calls it. Uh, it's Christopher McNally. Thank you very much for joining us, Chris. We really appreciate you coming on. Uh, thanks for having me, Jay. Well, uh, you wrote an article which appeared in the Sunday Star Advertiser um, about uh, about economics and the coronavirus. Uh, and, you know, people talk about, certainly uh, Dr. Trump, uh, the fellow in Washington, he talks about, um, you know, global economics or at least national economics and, uh, and how our uh, economy is being affected and will be affected by the coronavirus. But to hear it from you is different, and I'd like to discuss your article with you and get a handle on where this is all going in terms of economics. So can you summarize the article? As I recall, there were three factors, three phenomena that were operating. One is uh, uh, interruptions to the supply chain, interruptions to uh, demand, and interruptions to uh, financial financial availability. So can you talk about that? Yeah. So um, the first thing is that this is probably unprecedented in terms of its economic impact. So there's really no historical playbook to go by. When the 1918 flu hit, uh, we were in a very different type of global economy, and we just had finished World War One. So what we're getting is basically three different types of shock. The first shock, as you mentioned, is a supply shock. It basically started when China shut down its industrial and manufacturing economy, and as a result, many companies from South Korea to Germany were lacking parts. Uh, to some extent, companies were able to deal because they have parts in inventory. Uh, they were able to source some of the parts from other countries, and then when China gradually started to return, uh, to business as normal in its manufacturing sector, then early March, mid-March, so just basically around now, uh, they started to airlift a lot of these parts. Uh, but the problem is the supply shock is continuing uh, because a lot of companies now in the United States are starting to shut down, plus we've had shutdowns in South Korea, and we're getting quite major shutdowns in Europe, especially Italy, where they basically have done the same thing the Chinese have been doing, which is just shut down their whole uh, manufacturing sector, especially up in the north in Lombardia uh, and other parts of Veneto of Italy, of northern Italy. So that's the first one. So the pipe well, you know, it sounds to me like on the first one, uh, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So if I order something from Amazon, <clears throat> and Amazon's still operating, you know, they they can see making a buck on this, and they have the, the people, the equipment, and they're determined. Jeff Bezos is determined to keep on functioning, and he knows that not only as a matter of business, but as a matter of protecting the country, he's got to keep supplying things, and he's in the best position to supply. But I order something from Amazon for my business or for my home, uh, and there's a, there's, a, um, there's, a, there's a manufacturer out there, and the manufacturer needs a, 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 a screw, a certain kind of little machine screw, call it 6SJ7 screw. Um, and somebody in his supply chain uh, is unable to manufacture and get to him that screw. Therefore, he stops. Therefore, Amazon stops. The whole chain is as weak as its weakest link. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. But the good thing is also there's a lot of flexibility in these chains. So there might be one manufacturer that cannot make that screw. They might be able to source another screw, or they might be able even to 3D print it. They've been doing that in Italy with certain parts uh, for the medical sector. And the real supply shock is actually more for things like face masks, uh, protective equipment for medical workers, as well as these test kits, which are clearly in short supply. Uh, and that is because the demand has gone up so much for certain things. Uh, and then the, the second shock, actually, I feel is much more significant at this point, and that's the demand shock. Uh, and that means a lot of companies that were fearing they couldn't supply cars or, or you know, electronics to the consumer now we're facing the opposite problem, which is there's no demand. Nobody wants to buy anything anymore uh, except uh, some household goods, protective equipment, etc. Uh, so what's happening is the economy is just going into a tailspin. There's no demand. Is that, is that real, Chris? Is it when, when, when people don't buy, when there is no demand, how much of that is real and how much of that is psychological? Oh, I think it's real at this point. I mean, imagine just the restaurant sector going into deep freeze. Uh, as well as basically the retail sector, clothing, everything, electronics. I mean, some people are still buying stuff online, uh, but 
for the most part, as you said, there's also a psychological factor where people just feel it's so uncertain they're not willing to purchase any big items. Uh, but at the same time, there's really this lockdown that just is shutting down so many retailers and so many service businesses uh, that you're getting a real demand shock. But it's not just in the U.S. It is global for this part. Yeah, I'm thinking. I'm thinking of a fellow who, uh, you know, either he has no money in reserve, which is a good part of the U.S. Maybe the U.S. more than other places, but also the fellow who has he has a little money, but now he's sort of getting economically depressed. He's saying, "Gee, this isn't going anywhere good, so I better I better hold on to my bank account. I can't spend it now, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna be on the sidelines. Just to think, I'm staying at home. I'm going to stay at home in terms of consumption." So things that have a you know a certain discretionary factor to them uh, will stop, uh, and that to me that's psychological too, isn't it? It is, it is. But I would argue that the psychological effect probably will really just kick in a year or two uh, when this whole affair is over, and people still are shell shocked and not willing to consume at the same level they did prior to this pandemic. Uh, at this point, what you're seeing is just a lot of people getting laid off or be fearing they will get laid off. Uh, as well as a lot of businesses shuttering down. So for individual entrepreneurs, uh, you know, owners of small and medium-sized businesses, these are highly uncertain times. Uh, so the demand shock is, is real. I mean, there's a psychological component to it, no doubt, but it, it is real. We are shutting down the economy in many parts of the country, and as I mentioned, globally as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, then uh, we could discuss this in the context of all of these factors, and we need to talk about the financial factor, but it seems to me that the, the dynamic that's working under all of this is the time factor. You know, so some people, uh, including Dr. Trump, uh, you know, they believe this is going to be over in a couple of weeks. Other people uh, don't believe it's going to be over till August, say. Other people, you know, say, well, it'll take the vaccine, so maybe that's a year and a half. Um, nobody knows for sure. But we know that, you know, there is a time factor, and I wonder if you could describe how that works. These things, do they, do they get worse? Do they compensate for themselves? Um, do they somehow improve internally as the time goes on? Or do they evolve into other phenomena that are worse? Well, the other phenomenon that is perhaps the worst is the financial shock. Uh, the Federal Reserve has done its utmost to forestall this. It's been pumping money into the economy at an absolutely unprecedented rate, so beyond what happened in 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, the Fed has really backstopped the whole economy. Uh, but it cannot help, you know, individual consumers who are laid off, uh, who might go on unemployment, therefore take a big pay cut, and otherwise face huge uncertainty. And there's quite a few people who are getting laid off who don't qualify for unemployment insurance in the first place. And for a lot of small and medium-sized businesses who are not as involved in the financial markets and therefore cannot take as much advantage of the backstop that the Fed has put in for the time being. And as you said, there's a time factor. So let's say this whole thing blows over by the end of May. We probably could get quite a rapid recovery without too much damage done. However, if it lingers on, and that does tend to be more likely given what we're seeing in the southern hemisphere, so it doesn't really seem to be stopping with warmer weather, which is one theory, so that the summer is just going to drive it away. Uh, it also doesn't look likely that we're going to get effective treatment or an effective vaccine in this very short time span. So if it goes beyond May, then you know all bets are off, basically, because a lot of businesses could go bankrupt. They could really disrupt the economy long term. And then this could ripple back into the financial system. So although you have a backstop, increasingly many borrowers are going bankrupt. They're, they're going belly up. Uh, and as a result, the financial institutions are taking a hit as well. Uh, they can waltz it off to some extent onto the government. And the Fed, as well as uh, fiscal spending, will help with this. But uh, th there could be enormous disruptions to the financial system in the sense that more and more companies go insolvent. And as a result, more and more of their financial institutions uh, go insolvent as well. Uh, and then there's basically going to be a slow motion freeze. Basically, what we've just been seeing in the last two weeks is going to happen in a slower way, but in a much more fundamental way, uh, and it will be difficult to get out of. Yeah, you know, one thing, one thing that strikes me is that um, we seem to be printing money. I mean, right now, the Fed is doing it, and, and I guess the Fed can do that without legislative action, because right now there is no legislative action. Um, can that continue forever? 
and uh, and Congress is doing trillions on this. Uh, uh, you know, and I'm not sure what they're going to do. That's a huge disappointment to find that they're locked up about that. Um, and I, I personally blame the Republicans, but that's just me. Um, in any event, they haven't taken action. When they do take action, it's going to involve multi-trillions of dollars. Can we keep going like that? Is it a bottomless pit? Doesn't that have a, you know, a huge fundamental effect on everything? Um, wh- where is the bottom? Where is the end of it? Where's the last nickel? Um, or, or is this uh, something that we can, you know, kid ourselves about forever? Well, I think you're you're going a bit further ahead. At this point, it's probably an excellent idea to engage in massive fiscal spending to get the economy, or at least to keep the economy from falling off an absolute cliff. Uh, and then at some point, you probably have to engage in another round of massive fiscal spending to get the economy moving up again. Um, this will leave an enormous amount of debt. Uh, however, what the consequences of that are going to be, that depends on your economic view, on your economic perspective. Uh, some in modern monetary theory would say that we as the United States own the U.S. dollar, the world's reserve currency. We basically can print money uh, for as long as people use the dollar. And since there's not much of an alternative, that could be a long time. Uh, Others on the more conservative side uh, would argue that such massive amounts of debt will lead to ultimate bankruptcy, not only of individual companies, but of the country as a whole. Uh, Mm -hmm. Again, that that is a debate we probably should be having a few months from now. Uh, At this point, I think it's better to really keep the economy from falling off a cliff. Yeah. Um, By the way, you mentioned that we, we have the reserve economy. Um, there, there have been people who, in the last few years, under Trump actually, who have questioned whether we should continue, whether we will continue um, to, you know, be the reserve currency in the world. Um, what effect do you think um, this, this, this crisis has, or will have, more like it, uh, on our position as the world's reserve currency? Again, I would suspect uh, for the short term, not too much, not too much of an effect, because there's really no viable alternative unless the Chinese really step up and internationalize uh, the renminbi, the Chinese yuan, in the meantime. Uh, there's been some comments out there that, you know, they could use this as an opportunity to price oil in their own currency in Chinese yuan, uh, especially from the Saudis, because they're not engaging in a price war with the Russians. Uh, and so the OPEC cartel, basically, its arrangement with Russia has fallen apart. Everybody is pumping oil like that. The price of oil obviously has been going down a lot. Uh, so, you know, there is that possibility. But again, I don't think it's something we should worry about because, honestly, China doesn't look that good as well. Uh, they are, you know, just coming out of this pandemic, but they're fearing a second wave, and we've already seen second and even third waves in places like Singapore and Hong Kong. So nobody's really out of the woods. I mean, out of the woods. I mean everybody looks bad. So Yeah, yeah. The status quo is the dollar as our reserve, as the world's reserve currency, and, and the Federal Reserve has, has acted accordingly. I mean, it's really been pushing dollars into other economies, from South Korea to Australia to Brazil. So, you know, there's been very responsible leadership in Washington we don't hear much about. Uh, you talk about China, and you are a China expert um, for years and years and years. Uh, you are a global economist. I, I don't know any other global economists like you, and I really appreciate that, Chris. Um, so, you know, the, the thing about China is, uh, you know, they, they have found a way to, um, I'm, I'm not sure it's the right way, I'm not sure it's the right way, but, uh, you know, to, to send people back to work, to start the, at least the supply demand, the supply chain going again. Um, and it, I guess it has suggested to uh, Mr. Trump that he should do the same thing. But if it backfires, uh, and it may in China, and I think more likely in the U.S., by going back to work too early, what happens then? Is the second wave of, of contagion, is the second wave of economic duress uh, the same or different as the first? Well, it's, it's difficult to say, but I would argue that once you get to a second wave of duress, so let's say, the, the, the goal in the United States right now is not to stop the pandemic. The goal in the United States is to flatten the curve, to keep the healthcare system from collapsing under the weight of an enormous amount of patients. Uh, And for that purpose, uh, if you look at where the curve is right now, and especially in a place like New York, and 
Governor Cuomo came out and said, we're probably 14 to 21 days away from hitting the peak. Uh, and after you hit the peak, you have to keep up. So we're, we're about at least five weeks uh, in continued lockdown. And it's possible that we'll get a wave spreading from the coast into the interior and the south of the country uh, that can, you know, prolong this substantially. So uh, the Chinese were somewhat lucky because of Chinese New Year, which is basically everything shut down anyway for about two weeks. They prolonged that by another two weeks, and in many cases for another few more. So they, they were able to basically get the industrial economy back on track within six weeks. But the service economy in China is still suffering, badly, badly suffering. So China is not out of the woods, not in any way, not economically. Mm. So, you know, that we talk about the, uh, the curve and flattening the curve. We talk about, you know, helping people in hospitals and the medical industry, uh, you know, to, to, to service uh, people who are sick and uh, to test them and to uh, and find medicines and all that. Um, but it seems to me that, that that's not necessarily directly connected to the uh, economics, because if you if you flatten the curve or not, you get the same number one way or the other. You get the same number of, of illnesses. And so it's really a question of whether you have enough hospital beds. But at the end of the day, this thing is going to go rampaging through our population nationally and internationally, and it's going to hit the same number of people either way, flat curve or sharp curve. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that. I'd be interested in your view, but is that – okay, good. But how does that – how does flattening or, or sharpening the curve um, give you a different result economically? Well, for what I – you know, I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, uh, but I do study, you know, dynamic, dynamic systems, basically, in this case, uh, political economies. But um, the trick is, is the earlier you test and the more rigorously and effectively you test, the more you can get a handle on where the disease is, who is uh, a potential carrier, and isolate these people, quarantine these people, do contact tracing, and then do effective treatment. That's basically... Uh, what so far Singapore, Hong Kong, and South Korea have been doing quite effectively. Uh, and don't forget, Singapore just today announced they're shutting down their bars. So, that. so they actually have been able to go through this without the kind of lockdowns that, you know, we've been instituting uh, and certainly nowhere close to what the Chinese have been doing, especially in Wuhan. Uh, so there is actually a way to deal with this uh, that is less economically disruptive but that both has failed for the United States. So the trick now is, is to keep the numbers as low as possible uh, for when you reach that peak. Uh, and you may be right that at this point, we might have the same amount uh, of uh, people who are afflicted by this, but we just want to spread it out over time so that our healthcare system doesn't collapse. Um, mm -hmm. Economically speaking, you could argue that maybe you want to get a quick peak uh, but then you're going to be killing a lot of people, and, and just psychologically, uh, if you look at what's happening in northern Italy, I don't think that's going to be very good for the economy long term, one way or another. So yeah. I, think, I think the human cost here uh, supersedes the economic cost. Uh, I, I differ with President Trump very deeply on this, uh, and um, we should keep flattening the curve. Now, it's absolutely possible that we'll flatten the curve. We'll go, you know, from maybe several thousand cases per day down to several hundred. Uh, and then it's just going to go on like this. And then the question becomes, what are we going to do? You know, are we going to try to go back to work? How much are we going to go back to work? What kind of social distancing measures are we going to use? So these are going to be questions that we're going to be facing uh, within one or two months. Uh, but again, at this point, I would say, uh, you know, keeping intact uh, some social distancing measures, maybe not going fully overboard, uh, some advocates, you know, going on a total lockdown and doing basically what the Chinese did. Mm -hmm. They barricaded up people's apartments and people's blocks, not letting them out. I mean, basically putting them in prison. Uh, I think that goes too far. Uh, and I think really what we need to do is get testing going. And, and, and that is just, for what I've seen so far, uh, for all of us, but especially the medical community, that has been a massive failure. That's just been a massive failure. And you get, you know, cities like Los Angeles that have now gone directly to the South Korea, you know, buying 500,000 tests. Uh, well, it's probably what well, probably we should be doing, but we should probably have around, you know, 30 million tests for this next month, for April. Uh, we need to test about 10% of our population to get a handle on this.
Yes, agreed. Um, you know, the other thing about this is, uh, well, I want to give you a hypothetical. My hypothetical is, uh, say, at um, January 1st, uh, uh, within a year, um, the curve goes way flat uh, and that there's, there's hope. There's medicines, there's uh, new techniques, new ways of containment, whatever you, whatever we need, we find, um, and we start going back to work. My question to you, and uh, you know, I, I just can't visualize this, but I'm sure you can. How does the economy knit back together? What what starts the you know the recovery economically, uh, and how does the sequence work so we get back to normalcy economically as a national economy? Well. This is, as I mentioned before, you, you could have a situation where the economy really, really crashes uh, and then kind of bottoms out for a few months. And, and one, as you said, one thing, you know, when people's psychology changes as well, and, and, you know, maybe there's a vaccine, but at least there could be more effective treatment and then the caseload really diminishes to an extent that the healthcare system can deal with it. Uh, once you reach that point, uh, there is going to be somewhat of a snapback, just People, there's going to be some pent up consumption. Uh, people going back to work in and of itself will change. They, you know, all of them, gas consumption is going to go up and things like that. Uh, but at that point, the economy still is uh, not going to be back to normal. Uh, and probably what you would need is a, is a massive infrastructure spending and indeed an income replacement uh, policy yet again. So uh, at that point, probably the only thing that really could jumpstart the economy is, is fiscal spending. Uh, given that our interest rates already at zero, and uh, supported by the Fed, so you could even issue special purpose bonds that are not, you know, on the books of the Treasury directly. That are some infrastructure bank or some UBI, Universal Basic Income Bank, uh, that issues these bonds directly to the Fed. The Fed basically monetizes them, or they, yeah, buys them up with, you know, native money, uh, and that's how you get the economy back on track. And you worry about how this all plays out uh, later on in terms of the debt that's been accumulated. Um, mm -hmm. And we should do that with international coordination. So every single country uh, on earth should be doing this at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. But what, what about, uh, you know, that period before we get to this, this bottom out point? I mean, do you see, um, and the bottom out point, you know, the, the way up, by the way, sounds like the new deal. Uh, to me, FDR all over again, WPA, all that. Um, but, you know, before we get there, are we going to be in, in what existed, you know, before the New Deal uh, kicked in here in the United States? Are we, are we going to be on, um, on, on soup kitchen lines? Are we going to be out of work, out of, out of homes, out of money? Are we going to be suffering the same way we did in the Great Depression? Well, I hope it's going to be better uh, for the simple reason that uh, a lot of our policymakers and academics have studied the Great Depression, uh, and the Federal Reserve has been doing things that are quite the opposite of what the Federal Reserve did in the Great Depression so far. So it's really put a backstop uh, on your, uh, what would be immediate uh, freezing up of the financial system. But as I mentioned, as you get more and more bankruptcies and layoffs and unemployment going through the economy, uh, the specter of a freezing of the financial system rises again, uh, and at that point it's going to be more difficult uh, to counteract it. Uh, so what you need from the federal government are, are you know, very sufficient income supports uh, going beyond unemployment. Uh, obviously they're thinking about this, uh, but the system we have is not set up very well to do so. Uh, a lot of European countries have a system where basically companies furlough people and the government takes care of 80% of their salary, and these people technically actually stay on the payroll. So as soon as things move back to normal, uh, companies can rehire them, and it's, it's much less disruptive to the economy. We will need to see how much we can do to create a somewhat similar situation in the United States. Uh, but ideally, that's the way we should be going as we kind of bottom out. So we need to keep these people on payroll. Otherwise, as you said, you, you're going to have mass individual bankruptcies, also bankruptcies of small and medium-sized companies, that could trickle up the food chain, go to big corporations, go into the financial system, uh, and in the end, yes, we end up with a great depression. But I really do hope we don't get there. Uh, and so far, the moves by policymakers, uh, at least the Federal Reserve, uh, have been, you know, given me some cause for optimism. Mm -hmm. I have many more questions for you, but we only have a little time left. I want to ask you my, my, most, um, my most interesting question to an economist. 
Okay, uh, you know, it, the, the Depression, um, and why does the word John Maynard Keynes Company, uh, you know, created a new, a new kind of thinking in economics, a new, new economic concepts, new way of looking at national and, and global economics in many places. Um, so uh, do you see that happening again? And my question, to go one step further, is it happening already? Are economists thinking new concepts here in a new time? Yes, it's been happening actually since the global financial crisis. I mean, to put it quite succinctly, we're all Keynesians again. Uh, so you mentioned whether we're going to have a new economy, economics. I think actually we're going to revive and in many ways revisit uh, Keynesian economics for the simple reason that uh, the neoclassical credo would be telling people to do nothing at this point and just let the economy collapse and clean it. You know, this is exactly what people were saying under Hoover in the early 1930s. Uh, we're not doing that. I mean, Congress is debating a $2 trillion fiscal stimulus. This is the biggest uh, in U.S. history, uh, at least, you know, in one single item. Uh, it has bipartisan support. They're going to get it done. Uh, there's obviously a big difference about how to do so, and, and some of the, I think those debates are relevant and should be had. Uh, I don't think to you know, doing a massive corporate giveaway will help the economy. Uh, most of this money should be spent on workers uh, directly uh, because those are the people who could be suffering first and those are the people who consume. Uh, and that's how you can avoid a massive, uh, you know, a demand shock that's worse than what we're going to be having anyway. Um, and then you get modern monetary theory that I just mentioned, which is basically Keynesian on steroids. Uh, it says we have, a federal, we have a reserve currency, we can print money at infinito uh, and into eternity. Um, and yes, that's actually what we're doing right now. Uh, and the consequences of that, I really don't know. Uh, you know, some people would say it's going to cause massive runaway inflation, or we would end up, so we'd end up in the 1920s uh, in Germany. Uh, others are saying we could end up in the 1970s, so we could have inflation but no growth and very high unemployment. Uh, and that is indeed a possibility. Uh, and the third group uh, would be saying, no, this is good, this is what we need to do, and uh, we won't be getting any inflation because the demand shock is going to create a deflationary spiral. So prices are going to drop across the board, except for some things like face masks, for example, right now. Uh, and um, we're actually on safe ground. But history will tell us. This, this will yeah. be the case of the 2020s, and it will transform economics, but don't ask me how. <laughs> we'll ask you how later. Uh, we'd like to keep up with you, Chris, and uh, I, I would like to check in with you from time to time to see how this, uh, you know, fantastic shift in, in uh, global history and economics uh, works out. Uh, Chris McNally, uh, global and political uh, economist par excellence at Chaminade. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Aloha.